Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steve Sellers, a senior writer here at The Post. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Sussman. He is the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and he's here to talk to us about the coronavirus pandemic, the lessons we learned from it, and how well prepared the world is for the next one. Mark Sussman, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Mark, let's start. I hope you can um, give me a little context to begin with. And looking back over the past three years as we face another anniversary, which countries do you think performed the best when you look at the data? Yeah, so really the countries that performed the best in retrospect were countries like South Korea or New Zealand. And those are countries that did early on the right kind of uh, contact tracing, masking restrictions, following up uh, on uh, you know, the initial illnesses, uh, early access to treatment and then vaccines when they were available, and that minimized the impact. Uh, now, of course, there was a lot of confusion early on in the days, and we didn't know the actions to take. But in retrospect, it's clear that uh, you know those kinds of early government nas nationwide uh, actions that those countries took left them in much better stead than some of the others. You know, there was a 2019 report, the Global Health Index, that rated the US very high. Um, it's a wealthy country, um, uh, a highly equipped healthcare system, um, not to mention, of course, philanthropic resources, unlike almost any other country. What went wrong here? Uh, well, first of all, let's remember what went right. And part of what uh, that index uh, focused on was the research and development capacity that the United States has, which is uh, by far uh, the most uh, impressive in the world in terms of medical research through the NIH and through uh, some of the pharmaceutical industry. And indeed, it was the work and a lot of the funding from the US that led to the development of the vaccines. But uh, what didn't work as well, and again, the United States was far from the only country to do, was actually able to uh, deal with the impact of the pandemic when it came through in terms of uh, the dissemination and implementation of the public health advice, having clear directions for the public that they were able to uh, you know, understand and trust and engage on. Uh, we had sort of slightly inconsistent uh, messages coming through at the time. And so there were a number of factors that uh, led to challenges, but it was certainly not the United States alone. This was this was a very much a global problem. So we've heard also about the importance of social cohesion in, in uh, advancing public health messaging, as you mentioned. What's the role of public policy and also of philanthropy in helping to build the kind of social cohesion which could prepare us better for a future pandemic? Well, I'd actually start with, uh, you know, trust in government and in institutions uh, mm -hmm. as much as social cohesion, that, that the public need to have faith that their governments, their medical authorities, their regulatory authorities have their best interests at heart, are deeply knowledgeable and thoughtful, and that when they are making public health recommendations, those are recommendations that can and should be followed and relied upon. And so that's critically important uh, in all kinds. And then Within societies, obviously, the social cohesion does matter in terms of just how you make sure there is equitable uh, access to uh, treatment, to uh, vaccines and, and other things when they become available. And that clearly did not happen, uh, again, in the United States and around the world. We know we saw that there were your know, wide divergencies in mortality rates across different uh, demographics and um, in uh, different areas of, of Again, globally, uh, this was true, and in the United States, this was true. This was not, in the end, an equitable uh, virus. It disproportionately mm -hmm. affected the poorest and most vulnerable, both in the United States and globally. Mm -hmm. So the, the foundation and public health officials both got dragged into politics in a way that I think was totally unprecedented and a, a great surprise to people. And let me ask you about one of those hot button topics, vaccine mandates. How has your thinking evolved through the past over the past three years about mandating a program like vaccines and whether the downstream effects of imposing vaccines can actually undo the benefits of, of having a mandate? Yeah, well, let's take a little bit of a step back and just, you know, in the context of the role of the Gates Foundation, you know, our mission is a simple one. It's to 
a vision to help every person have the chance to a healthy and productive life. And Bill and Melinda, uh, when they founded the foundation, were looking at where are the greatest areas of inequity preventing that from happening. And by far the greatest inequity was in childhood death. There were millions and millions of children dying in developing countries in the global south of fully preventable diseases that almost nobody died of in the global north. And the main tool to actually prevent those deaths is vaccines. Vaccines are a true miracle. Vaccines for pneumonia, uh, for rotavirus, which causes diarrhea, uh, those are the key elements that help bring down mortality. And in fact, over the last 20 years, uh, with the introduction of the Gavi Vaccine Alliance, which we were proud to be part of founding and the United States is a strong supporter of, along with many other governments, we have seen the rates of childhood deaths, preventable childhood deaths, drop from over 10 million a year to below 5 million a year. That is nearly all from vaccines, not exclusively, but a very large part. So vaccines work. Vaccines are amazing. There is no better tool because it's a tool that actually prevents uh, someone from getting ill. And so in terms of that, again, the word mandate gets you down lots of complicated rabbit holes. Mm. What we need to do <laughs> is, again, show the benefit, explain the benefit. This is true public good for mm. everybody, for yourselves, your families, your communities, for the world as a whole. And so, and vaccines, along with a whole lot of other health interventions, but vaccines are by far the most powerful in terms of uh, that prevention of childhood death uh, and in adult death, now uh, in the case of, of COVID and other diseases like that. And so how you convey that message effectively how you build, again, public faith and trust and understanding uh, that this is a tool that is a highly beneficial tool, highly efficacious, and that has benefits well outside of for individuals, but for entire communities. That's the set of messaging that we want to focus on. And they can be almost, vaccines can be almost too good for their own good, if you like, right? We forget the scourges of measles because we haven't experienced them or polio. And yet in this country, we're seeing a resurgence. Are you concerned right now about uh, the lack of messaging or the, our inability to create that messaging? Or is this a purely American problem? Is it not something that you're seeing overseas with these vaccine preventable diseases? No, your, your example of measles is a very powerful one mm -hmm. where, yes, uh, in many wealthy countries, including the United States, people have forgotten uh, just how deadly and challenging these diseases are. You know, polio within living memory in the United States was a disease affecting millions of people. Uh, and that fear uh, was able to go away because of the advent of the polio vaccines. Now, polio still exists globally. And in fact, we had a uh, discovery of wild polio virus in uh, New York State recently. Uh, so it's showing that it can still come into the country, but people don't understand that. Fear. Similarly with measles, we've had uh, a couple of measles outbreak here in the United States because what we did is we went below the necessary herd immunity where you have collective vaccination rates that prevent the spread of measles. And then once people see the disease and it's a horrible, deadly disease, then they're willing and able to uh, have the vaccines. And actually in many uh, low and low middle income countries, we actually find there's much more appetite and understanding and enthusiasm to get uh, some of those childhood vaccines because they see those illnesses uh, in their communities every day. So yes, I think that is one of the, the challenges and one of the sets of messages we need to constantly uh, reassert, help the public understand why this is so important, that it's not simply, again, about choice for yourself. It's actually about public health for your family, your community, as a whole, uh, it's, and for society as a whole. Mark, I'd like to ask you a little bit more specifically about the role of the Gates Foundation during the, the pandemic and also looking ahead towards another one. So if you to look back over the past three years, I, I love your what went right question. I also, also want to ask you about a, a what you would do differently question. So looking back, choose the thing that went really well over the past three years and also tell me when you're looking ahead, what you would be sure to do differently if we get an if and when a new pandemic hits us? Uh, well, I fear it is going to be when rather than if. So we right. should come I, back to I that so. because uh, yep. you had that 
and, and you know, I feel the world is not taking the action that we need to, to be ready for that next pandemic. But when we look at the last one, what really went right, going back to, is the vaccines. People don't understand how unprecedented it was to get the vaccines so successfully so early. We work on vaccines in many other areas. We've been working for vaccines in malaria, for example, which is a scourge that kills, uh, affects tens of millions of people every year and kills uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of children, millions of children over many years. And we're, current vaccines have efficacy rates of you know, 30 to 40 percent. The COVID vaccines ended up having efficacy rates of 80, 90 percent, uh, the mRNA ones. That is really, really unusual. And to be able to get that early and to get it with new technologies like mRNA, which is a technology we were very early investors in at the Gates Foundation, uh, but at a time nobody thought it was going to work. They thought that was a pipe dream. We, we invested in it uh, because most people were looking at it as a potential cancer treatment, and we thought perhaps it could be useful for TB or malaria, and we still think now it may be. But, you know, that's amazing, and it has brought powerful lessons for the future, the mRNA technology itself, how you think about the world of vaccine infrastructure, that's the big positive. The negative was the distribution, that mm. it was not equitably distributed. Once these vaccines came online, the reality was there was a bit of a chase, particularly by wealthy countries, that locked up most of the available supply. There were good efforts, including those supported by the United States and others, like the COVAX initiative, that were intended to try and alleviate that and provide vaccines uh, to the most at-risk populations in developing countries at the same time. But the truth is, in a supply-constrained environment, that failed, at least in the early parts of 2021, which is when the vaccine rollout was happening. Now, over time, we got that right. COVAX ended up distributing over 2 billion doses of vaccines in 146 countries. But the delays meant that many highly at-risk people did not get vaccines at a time their lives might have been saved when many, many low-risk people in wealthier countries got vaccines. And so putting in place a structure and a system up front that allows both countries to uh, put in place broader public health uh, emergency authorities, and I'm happy to come back to that, it goes back to your first question, uh, but then specifically on the equitable manufacturing at scale and then distribution of vaccines and or treatments, because actually in future pandemics, we might get therapeutics, which are treatments uh, more rapidly than we get a vaccine. We were very lucky on the vaccine in COVID. So Mark, I'm, uh, what I'm hearing is that the Gates Foundation did the right thing in investing in these mRNA technologies early on, recognizing their potential. And then you're seeing this problem. So now that you're overseeing this foundation, are you redirecting, are you pivoting to redirect more funds towards distribution or helping distribution? How, what, what is happening within the organization? Uh, yes, yeah, so our primary goal, is, again, is to look where there are gaps in equity. Now, there are still many more children dying of pneumonia and malaria. There are many more people dying of HIV and tuberculosis. And in fact, deaths from those diseases increased during the pandemic. And that is after 20 years of decreasing. People generally, it's not just the childhood mortality that I talked about with vaccines, but the first two decades of the 21st century saw unprecedented improvements in global health. We saw halving in deaths from HIV AIDS largely through initiatives like PEPFAR, the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS, which just had its 20th anniversary, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And we saw a halving in deaths in HIV, a halving in deaths in tuberculosis, a halving of deaths in malaria, not through vaccines, but through bed nets and other treatments. That was amazing public health success. Those have all been set back in the last two years. We've seen, we're not yet back to the vaccination rates we were in 2019 globally. We've seen an uptick in the other diseases. So our primary focus for our core resources still goes, where are the greatest inequities happening and where are people dying right now? And so we remain very, very focused on those core infectious diseases that disproportionately affect the poorest. But on the pandemic space, we're saying the world as a whole, having just come through this unprecedented crisis with millions of deaths, with trillions of dollars of economic damage, and with, I say, the inevitability that there will be another virus and pandemic at some point, should be investing much more clearly in a range of uh, 
interventions. There should be a global health emergency call set up, ideally at the World Health Organization. There should be you know, investments made for the provision of manufacturing capacity. There should be investments made ready for diagnostics that will be able to be used uh, rapidly. All of those are critical. And so we are advocating for that. We have some sets of investments uh, that are supporting it. But really, the challenge is this should be governments taking action, putting resources in at scale, because it's the ultimate public good for their own citizens. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the World Health Organization, because one of the things the pandemic revealed to us, right, is that it was not just a health disaster, it was also an economic disaster, as you mentioned, a national security threat. I mean, I could go on. Do we need a body that is a, a, above the World Health Organization, that has teeth, a leadership level body that has teeth to deal with these sorts of issues in an uh, international format? Well, I think the World Health, World Health Organization has the mandate to deal with global health. The question is, will member states give it the resources, give it the authority, give it the technical mm -hmm. expertise to actually carry out that mandate? At the moment, it's funding and is well short of what's needed. Uh, we are bizarrely, I always go there to the Gates Foundation, we're the second largest funder of the World Health Organization after the United States as a philanthropy. Uh, and really, the world should be investing five to 10x more in global health. When it comes to pandemic preparedness, some of the things that are relatively cheap, you know, the G20, which the U.S. is part of, who commissioned a set of reports about what should be put in place uh, going forward. And they recommended annual investments of around $10 billion a year, not all of which would go to WHO. This is for a range of activities, including what we call surveillance infrastructure in countries. So you're able to track and identify emerging pathogens as soon as they come out. Uh, it's around the manufacturing or workforce capacity but an element of it would be helping a particular specialized emergency corps sitting most likely at the WHO with regional affiliates. And $10 billion a year is a lot of money, but it's a tiny amount of money relative to the resources that were put in play by governments, particularly wealthy governments during the pandemic. To date, the amount of money committed uh, to what is now a, a pandemic fund that sits at the World Bank for this is a total, one-off total of $1.6 billion. That's important money. Mm -hmm. The Gates Foundation has contributed to that. Uh, it's about to start making its first disbursements, so it calls for proposals, but it's a fraction of what's really needed. Yeah. Mark, we've had some very interesting questions coming in from readers, and I want to read one to you that came from Edward Metzler. He's in Oklahoma. And Mr. Mettler writes, uh, how has AI been applied by the Gates Foundation for Pandemics? And what are your future plans? I think this is so interesting because I know it's something that Bill Gates has been talking about recently. Yeah, well, it, look, it's a great question. AI is, uh, everyone is fascinated by AI at the moment. We are certainly looking at it across multiple areas of our work, not just in our, we work on education primarily in the US mm -hmm. and there are interesting things you can think of AI in terms of helping students uh, advanced through high school and college, uh, that we already are looking at ways to use AI, for example, in uh, helping uh, to make low resolution images connected with cell phones of um, basically radiography of, say, pregnant women in low resource settings where you'll be able to uh, identify potentially at risk births and things like that. Within the pandemic uh, preparedness, you know, I think there will be important applications probably around the you know, early identification of uh, potential pathogens, if we, uh, but we need the infrastructure to at least uh, pick those up, and then you know, uh, running through potential therapeutic or vaccine treatments. But you know, that, it, it remains to be seen. It's still, at the moment, the hype around what AI can do uh, is in advance of the reality, but it, it is truly a very exciting tool, which I suspect will have lots of applications in health. Yeah, and so not only, I guess, in, in following up in a pandemic circumstance in, you know, Africa with people needing to get information, but potentially domestically with the scourge of chronic illness, right? You could bring in a digital form of healthcare. Is that something the, the foundation is also looking into? Yeah, so uh, we don't focus on um, sort of the non-infectious diseases where there's, a, it's not because diseases like cancer or heart disease or chronic disease are not really important. They, they are, and they affect millions of people, but they are also relatively well-resourced that you do get 
significant amounts of money from the US, from other governments putting in their research. Diseases like malaria are not well resourced, uh, but affect many millions of people. And so our resources have tended to focus again on those infectious diseases that disproportionately affect the world's poorest uh, as a kind of public good, because we're filling a gap there. Um, but absolutely within that, I think there are digital tools that even in very low resource settings can be incredibly helpful in terms of wider public health infrastructure. So again, simply using now that there's widespread access to cell phones they can allow you to track better patient records for, again, pregnant women before and after birth, for vaccination charts and tracking the same uh, infants, for making sure you get triage from primary to secondary to tertiary healthcare facilities. All of those kind of digital tools, we absolutely are working on a number of models uh, in Africa and Asia that uh, have very exciting uh, potential. And I think the uh, pandemic, one of the few silver linings of the pandemic was it actually uh, encouraged innovation and engagement of tools like that, which there's now mm -hmm. greater public acceptance of at least experimenting. Mark, you made the point very clearly, we're not thinking about if, we're talking about when. One of the uh, potentials on the horizon is the H5N1. Uh, how worried should we be about that particular pathogen and what would sh should we know about it right now? Yes, so um, on that one again, I, you know, I want this is where you want health authorities to be speaking uh, rather than uh, philanthropy. So I will let the health authorities opine more broadly on H5N1 and other diseases. What it is, though, like the recent monkeypox uh, outbreak and so on, are just reminders that we are constantly facing a threat of multiple pathogens, any one of which could potentially become the next COVID. Uh, now, I'm hoping uh, none of the current ones will. I have no evidence that they are. But all of that points to why the world should be investing much more deeply and comprehensively into the full array uh, of investments from surveillance uh, to the research and development to the potential of manufacturing facilities, to the support of uh, international organizations like WHO and others that can provide support in low resource settings uh, to help ensure that as and when that next pathogen comes, we're able to respond much more quickly and effectively than we were able to do in COVID. And again, I don't want to be alarmist around it, but it, you know, it's clear that the risk is not just of a naturally occurring pathogen, but you know, there's risks of bioterrorism or other uh, tools that uh, we should be aware of and think treat that as a threat as well and make sure that uh, we are ready uh, to respond immediately rather than sort of responding uh, only after the fact. Well, one of the other looming threats, of course, is climate change, which shifts where animals uh, are living, shifts our relationship to other uh, animals, other mammals. What is the role of climate change in the threat of new pandemics? And what's the foundation doing to address that? Yeah, so, well, oh. climate change is a huge topic in and of itself. On the specific bit of disease, clearly there are significant health impacts. It's, as you say, one of it is the changing climates and ecosystems, which allow animals uh, to, to move habitats and move things. And that creates the potential for all sorts of new uh, zoonotic diseases, many of which might jump over from animals to humans. And that's not just uh, wild animals, obviously, it's, it's livestock as well. And you know, as you've mentioned, you know, avian flu or uh, swine flu or others like that with the risks. So that's clearly uh, one of the risks. More broadly, uh, when you get change in there, it changes disease for vector-borne diseases, mosquito-borne diseases like dengue fever or malaria, obviously, can operate in new areas. Uh, but the biggest public health impact, frankly, which is already happening right now at scale and is underappreciated, is the shift in climate. You get much more dramatic floods and droughts, and those are happening disproportionately in sort of central tropical Africa and tropical Asia. The, the parts of the world that contributed least to climate change already been affected. The Horn of Africa, for example, is in its fifth year of drought. Yes, that's a place that has recurrent drought. They've never had five years of drought. And that's got you know, tens of millions of people requiring food aid, hundreds of millions of people become food insecure. Pakistan had these amazing floods last year where a third of the country was inundated. They've had floods before, but never of that scale. 
they were unable to do their planting. They were unable to do, uh, the, you know, create the, the food that they need to, uh, to feed themselves and to uh, generate income. And that, again, has a massive impact on undernutrition, uh, which has a long-term lifetime effects on, on children who don't get properly nourished uh, when they're infants. And that's happening right now. So at the Gates Foundation, again, our primary focus in the climate space has actually been in what we call that agricultural adaptation space, where mm -hmm. we're trying to help develop more drought and flood resilient crops and livestock that are going to help these smallholder farmers, because most of the poor are rural poor. They depend on farming for their livelihoods. And again, that's a gap because it's just not being funded at any significant scale elsewhere, but it should get much more resources. Mark, we've talked about preventing through vaccines, we've talked about managing through treatment uh, of illness, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about investment in surveillance, which seems again to be an incredibly important topic as we think about a, a future pandemic. Yeah, so surveillance, absolutely. So surveillance, you know, it has its, and when people think of surveillance, they're often sort of thinking of spy craft. And I, what we're talking in the health space is simply the infrastructure that's able to identify an emerging pathogen as quickly as possible, wherever it might break out. That means laboratory capacity that's able to track, break down uh, the genomic structure of a molecule, see if it is a new pathogen, see what the risks are. You know, if we take a counterfactual, if let's go back a few years to the outbreak of the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Uh, that Ebola was initially circulating undetected because these were very low resource settings that didn't have the surveillance infrastructure for many weeks before it finally, the, you know, the outbreak uh, was identified. Luckily, and it's difficult to say luckily for diseases authors Ebola, but you know, Ebola spreads by being in touch, in physical contact mm -hmm. with a patient that's had uh, Ebola. That if Ebola had been a respiratory disease, spreading like COVID through droplets in the air, you know, the risk of those three to four weeks of it circulating unidentified could have been absolutely catastrophic. So surveillance is we should have infrastructure everywhere on the planet, across Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe, that is equipped, that is globally connected, including to World Health Organization, but to national health uh, authorities, uh, including uh, agents like the CDC uh, here in the US, and able to track, identify, share information as a public good. That's actually, in some ways, the most critical first step of investments. And it's, it's one that we're hoping this new pandemic fund that I mentioned that's sitting at the World Bank is going to be prioritizing with its early resources, even if it doesn't have as many resources as it should have. I feel this is a very, very high, no regret set of investments. This is going to keep American citizens safer, uh, it's going to keep citizens anywhere on the planet safer uh, by investing everywhere on the planet to make sure we have that infrastructure that's able to do the genomic sequencing, uh, that to be able to track um, evolving treatments. Again, if you think, I'm not sure how familiar most people were with the idea of variants before COVID suddenly mm -hmm. had variants, you realize we had to track them. Mm -hmm. And how do you track and identify a variant? And we were dependent we got lucky that you know South Africa first identified some of those variants and then other countries did. That's the kind of infrastructure we need globally put in place. Mark, I want to squeeze in one last question. We're running out of time, but um, this week we've heard a revival of the lab leak theory um, of, for the origin of the coronavirus. Um, what's your thought about that and how should it inform future action? And maybe surveillance is part of that, but Tell me where that belongs in our yeah. thinking. Well, about look, there, there are multiple investigations that have been carried out by, you know, credible authorities who, again, have far more expertise than I do. Uh, and it's important that those take place. But really, my focus wants to be, regardless of, you know, the origins, the main point that I want to make sure is conveyed today, it is when, not if, from whatever source, the world will face another pandemic threat like COVID-19. And so because we know that's going to happen, it makes complete sense. It is a very, very cheap insurance policy to be collectively putting together that $10 billion a year from you know, wealthy countries that would be that global insurance policy. And it is amazingly short-sighted, I feel, and we feel at the foundation, that the world is not putting in those resources, given what we've just experienced and been through. 
And so, you know, if there's one single message I want to take, certainly as a philanthropy, we will do what we can. But this is even as a very large philanthropy, this is not a gap we can fill. And frankly, it's not a gap we should fill. This is a core obligation of governments is to the health and well-being of their own citizens. And this is one of the cheapest, most effective public good investments that could be made. It's in the national interest. It's in the global interest. It's in everyone's interest. And, you know, I just uh, we will keep raising our voice. Um, but uh, hopefully we will hear governments and others respond because we need to make sure that a disaster like COVID-19 does not happen again at the scale it did. Mark Sussman, a powerful message there about when, not if, and the need to invest in stopping this from being so disastrous. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all to our viewers for joining us too for that fascinating conversation. You know where to find future programming on WashingtonPostLive.com. Come back and join us. Um, I'm Francis T. Sellers, and thank you for joining us.